communicate somehow, you know, that pass across our feelings, our opinions, whatever it is we have to pass to others. So we have to learn to talk to each other in order to, you know, reduce the differences of opinion, the differences of interests. So conflict management field specializes in helping people communicate more effectively. You find out that most conflicts happen because there's a breakdown in communication or, it's bad, or there is bad communication or there's even no communication at all. Even in our various families, when husbands and wives fight or they claim to have problems, if you look deep down, you see that communication it has a role to play. Either the lack of it, bad communication, or, you know, communication that is not appropriately passed across. So as a conflict manager, it is important to, first of all, know the skills of communicating well. When you as a conflict manager knows the skill, when you acquire those skills, it puts you in a better position to help conflicting parties to also communicate appropriately. And that is the essence of a course, a training like this. Prof, I can't see my screen again. Uh, okay. Are you seeing the general screen? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm seeing your slide. I'm seeing my slide by the side. Uh, Is this? Uh, okay, let me continue with your slide. Okay. Cannot see it again. You can't see your slide again. Yes. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Just give me a minute. Okay. Just less than a minute. Self. I will share this one. Okay. So oh. mm -hmm. Okay. So communication is very key to everything we do as human beings in our society, in our families, wherever we are. So in settling of conflicts, as a conflict manager, it is important that you acquire the skills yourself. You know what and how to, you know, make effective communication so that you're in a position to guide conflicting parties to communicate better. When you find that most, most um, issues of conflict that happen either at the national level or at you know um, the family level or organizational level, you find out that it is traceable one way or the other to communication, and that is the essence of this kind of training. So that when people are able to communicate better, then it um, it reduces the conflicts that we have in the society. Please let me try and get my screen back. Prof, are you still trying to share screen with me? Yes, it's coming up now. Okay. Don't go wrong. Yes. Fast it is up. Your screen is up now. Can you see? Hello, Dr. Jekwe. Okay. No, I can't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see it. I can see it now. Minimized growth. Okay. Is it okay now? I can't move it. No, I'm helping you to share. Yeah, it is, but it's not okay. Yeah, it's okay. I'm helping you to share it. So I really oh, want to okay. move it. Wow. Okay. So please move it. <laughs> okay. I've gone beyond here. Now you can move it. You can move it now. I will have love to move it myself. Yes, you can move it now. Okay. It's not moving. Sorry. No, I'm not there. Yet. There's something wrong. 
I'm moving it now, but I've allowed you, I've assigned it to move it. Please, can we go back? I'm not here yet. I'm not here yet. It's okay. Is this? The earlier slide, please. This is the earlier slide. Okay, yeah. Yes, can I move it by myself? Yes, I think you should be able to move it. I think it's easier that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I know what. Can you move it now? Yes, you can move it. No, we... okay. You are the one moving guess... it now. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we'll move from here. It's too slow. To come on. So basically, communication can be used both positively and negatively. Yes, I think this is where you are. This is my own slide, yes. Yes, uh, you are moving it. Okay. I mean, this is where, this is the slide you are talking on. Yes, yes. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. So, communication, sorry for the interruption there. Communication can be used positively or negatively. That is, it can be a dysfunctional tool in conflict management. And it can be a functional tool. When it's dysfunctional, that means it is playing a negative role in that conflict. However, if it is functional, then it is, you know, playing a positive role. Communication it can precipitate and support factors that increase violence in a conflict. It can also weaken factors that promote peace. But as a functional tool, it can make, you know, it can support violence. It can weaken the factors that support violence and it can create and support factors that support peace. So it's one end to the other. Communication can play a double role. So the conflict management field specializing in helping people communicate more effectively because like I said earlier, at the root of every conflict, you find communication playing a role, the lack of it or the none of it at all. So conflict managers must help conflict parties learn to communicate effectively. So as to maximize potentials for peace and reduce potentials for violence. So the job of a conflict manager is to ensure that he or she does everything to move away, to move communication to the point that can achieve the desired result. That is amongst conflicting parties. And he must therefore also have the skills and be an expert in communication. Okay. Okay. So, as um, a communication expert or specialist, there are certain questions that a conflict manager must ask when he's trying to, you know, settle a conflict or be involved or manage a conflict. And the questions include: What role is communication playing in this conflict? How are the parties using communication in this role? What can we do to minimize the dysfunctional role of communication in this conflict? What can we do to maximize functional role of communication in this conflict? Once the conflict manager gets answers to these questions, then communication becomes, you know, better in conflict resolution. Okay, now the next part is communication conflict measures. That is the relationship between communication 
and conflict. Communication and conflict are connected at every stage of the conflict circle, before the conflict, during the conflict, and after the conflict. So good communication is essential in peaceful relationships. The problems can, you know, communication problems can escalate the conflict, whereas if communication is well used, that is appropriately, it can diminish the problems that are that are fueling such um, such conf such conflict. Now, talking about the pre-conflict stage, we have the pre-conflict, you have the conflict stage and the post-conflict stage. And at every of these points, communication is key. So before conflict, miscommunication or bad communication skills could be the cause of the conflict itself. At the same time, conflicts often arise because of these communication problems as well. Breakdown in communication is also a, you know, a common byproduct that can propel a conflict, if not well, you know, utilized. So... Now, we've talked about pre-conflict. In conflict, that is during the conflict, communication also becomes a weapon of conflict for parties. People use communication to, you know, throw out threats, abuses, name calling, and what have you. They use it to, you know, express their your emotions, their fears, their anxiety, their anger. They use it to mobilize people to be on their side. And, you know, when they fail to communicate, their interests and needs, you know, at the same time will not be, will not be properly projected to the other party. So the aim, you know, is to ensure that um, communication is well utilized in resolving conflicts. My slides are going back and forth. So, hello, Doc. Yes, my slides are going back and forth. It's not funny. Uh, uh, don't, okay, I think it's your system. Okay. It's your system. So I'm controlling it from here since I noticed that the system okay. seems to be hanging. Are you seeing the screen? I'm seeing the screen. I'm trying to see where I stopped. Yeah. This is the next. You stopped here. Okay. Yeah. And this is where. So don't bother to control it from your side. You know, because okay. of your system is. <laughs> okay. So just as I've been saying, communication is the means by which conflict is managed. It can be used dysfunctionally. It can be used functionally. Communication can, can be destructive, it can be constructive. That is negatively used or positively used, depending on how you manage it. And that is why a conflict manager must ensure that he or she already acquires these skills in order to guide the conflicting parties to settle, to manage, or to resolve conflict. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. That's the next slide. It is. No, I passed it. Mm. I think I moved it. So Wait. conflict managers have a role to play in moving parties from the dysfunctional use of communication to the functional use in order to get to, you know, um, a solution or ability to manage the conflict that is at hand. Therefore, you as a conflict manager must also be familiar with the basics, with the things you need to have, with the skills you need to have in order to communicate effectively in conflict. I'm done with that. Something. Now, post-conflict, 
this was where I was from. <laughs> so communication must be employed in conflict management as a means, one, to express parties' interests and needs, which are usually the bottom line of you know, most conflict. You know, parties have different interests, conflicting interests and needs. As a result of that, the differences come to the fore, leading to conflict. So as a conflict manager, you must be able to use communication to negotiate and reach agreements by which third parties, you know, uh, by which you can intervene as a third party. Still talking about communication and you know conflict measures, the relationship between them. Many people are very sophisticated at sending and interpreting messages and improving their communication skills for conflict management only means fine-tuning certain particular techniques. Most of us at a certain stage, at a certain age, due to some exposures, already know how to you know, use communication. But at the same time, it costs a training like us in conflict resolution. Now we're going to session two of this, which is some issues in communication. We'll be looking at some issues that are paramount in communication when you want to use it for successful you know, management of conflict. So breakdown and misunderstandings do occur in communication because of our various exposures, our background, our different interests and needs, and you know, because we are not born the same. Even twins normally have differences of opinion, likes and dislikes. So it's a normal thing to have misunderstandings. But when communication breaks down, most of the time you find out that that's where the conflict really escalates, okay? But when there is breakdown, they are repairable. If you use the right skills, break down and then find solution as desired. So misunderstandings can be explained, languages can be translated, relationships can be restored using the right skills of communication. Sometimes it doesn't happen overnight and sometimes it can happen as you know quickly as you may want it. So with the right skills of communication, rumors can be controlled, escalation of such conflicts can be limited through clear verbal communication that is talking. Another aspect or another issue that we must take note of in communication using appropriate communication in conflict is the conduit metaphor. The conduit metaphor, which you know, we can break into to the metaphor, semantics, and so on. There's another one that is words are harmless. People often feel, often say that words are harmless. Meanwhile, you cannot say that because of the reasons I'm going to give to you now. So there's this belief, conduit metaphor has the opinion or brings out or believes that language is like the postal service. That is, you can just transfer ideas and then it is received exactly the way you want it, but that is not the way it is. A sender puts his thought or feelings into words, gives or sends his words to a receiver, he unpackages the message. No, that is not how it works because of the various differences in background, in worldview, in interest and needs that I mentioned earlier. So the simplicity, the simplistic metaphor of language, which is often, you know, propagated, is misleading because it doesn't happen like that. It is not exactly the way a sender encodes a message the that the, the receiver interprets it. And those are the areas of conflict, people. usually. Like you can't buy anything, you have to be instrumental for me. Can I hear that? talking about conduit metaphor, it gives an erroneous belief that what one intends to say is what is heard by the listener. Usually, the process of communication starts from the encoder. That is the person that has the urge to send a message, to pass an opinion across. 
When he does that, it passes through a channel and of course it gets to the receiver. Sometimes along that channel, there may have been some inter interferences. There could have been noise, there could have been anything that would distort such a message. So by the time the sender, by the time the hearer or the receiver is getting the message, he may interpret it differently from what the sender intends. So misunderstandings are therefore, you know, expected and, you know, recognized. But the conduit metaphor says that, you know, misunderstandings are unexpected and often, you know, should not be recognized. This makes one believe that the receiver is, you know, either stupid or malicious for responding as they did. But you cannot always blame them because there are different, you know, backgrounds, worldviews, the way we reason things out, the way we have our opinions, which, you know, have been um, we have been painted by our worldview and our experiences. So it is not automatic that the way a sender, you know, passes a message across is the same way that the receiver would interpret it. So a more accurate description of communication is that the speaker attempts to code ideas, feelings, and images with words. How it is received is a different matter. And it is when it is not received this way it is intended that we usually have conflicts of interest. The words are transmitted to the listener who then matches them with their own experiences. So the likelihood of them both interpreting the information the same way is low particularly in conflict. When, 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 when we have conflict amongst or between people, the, whatever it is they are trying to pass across at such point may be misunderstood. They may even pass the wrong way. Why so? It is important to... Um, let me think. So the way we use words differ from one person to the other. And that is why we should expect that there could be multiple, you know, attempts at uh, interpreting such words, which may be positively received or negatively received. The more cultural differences there are between speakers, the more frequently they will have to stop and work out differences of meaning. Apart from cultural differences, our worldview differences can lead to us interpreting you know, taking communication different ways, encoding whatever has been, you know, passed to the other party. So the conduit metaphor as we have been saying, highlights two important aspects of language. Metaphor, which I talked about earlier, and then semantics. Semantics has to do with meaning. Metaphor is one of the most powerful linguistic devices, of course. It expands understanding by relating the unknown to the familiar. When you say life is a race, that's an example. An example is like saying he is, he is a rock. He's a rock. Probably that person is very strong. You say he's a rock. So you're, you're, you know, you're using the, um, the values of one particular thing to represent another. So metaphors make it easier to understand unfamiliar ideas. So the hidden danger of this linguistic device is that while creating associations of function or meaning, they also transmit value judgments. So these are body soldiers. You could also, are you also saying that soldiers are killers? You know, you look at that comparison. And most of the things we do in life, you know, are metaphoric in nature. Sometimes the metaphor is so subtle or commonly used that one is unaware it is even there. But most of our life's experiences are metaphoric in nature. So in conflict management or in conflict, 
how does metaphor you know really come in problem arises when the speaker's metaphor does not represent the same meaning as the listeners just what i've been saying earlier that if you if the if the list if the um the sender and the receiver have different perspectives about you know whatever message is being sent then if, if uh, differences of opinion or differences of interpretation will likely lead to conflict. An example here, the expression time is money may have different meaning for you know, different people. To one person, it may be that money is meant for pleasure, while to the other person, money is to be invest, invested wisely. So it depends on how such individuals are interpreting it. Now, talking about semantics, semantics refers to the specific meanings of words as well as the value, the value they carry beyond their definition. One could, for instance, call a woman a lady, a girl, a mom, a niece, or so many other names. But the difference between these terms and the reason the addressee will prefer one to the other or be offended by one is based on the value she places on each definition. What we're saying here is that the value that is placed on maybe a word or something that's come out of, the, uh, of communication may determine how the receiver would, or maybe the other conflicting party, for instance, would receive such a thing. For instance, if you say, in our clients here, you find people talking about generosity. A lady that shares maybe material things, she loves to give money and so on, can be seen to be generous. And if you tell her, you're so generous, madam, she'll probably give you a smile. But if it's a lady that's a bit flirtatious, and you tell her you're so generous. So maybe it's a guy that says that she may take offense because you know she may interpret it to mean that she's giving herself to someone. So semantics, that is the value we pay, place on anything at all, can determine how um, language or how communication can be received. Therefore, a clear understanding of semantics, that is meaning, is crucial to preventing misunderstandings. If you are aware that a word may be ambiguous in meaning, or you know, you have to pick and choose the kind of words you use one as a conflict manager. So when you are trying to bring two parties together to settle a conflict, your understanding, your understanding of semantics will help you know, you know, we'll be able to let you know where they are perceiving things from. We'll be able to get to the underlying issues, the underlying, you know, issues causing the conflict because you're able to understand that the value placed on certain issues or certain sentiments, you know, may have caused such a misunderstanding. Arguments frequently occur when two people think they are talking about the same thing, but really they are just using the same word for two different ideas or things. We're still repeating the same thing here that two people may interpret a particular thing from different perspectives based on their experiences, based on their environment, their world as a conflict manager, then it becomes easy to be able to bring parties together to resolve their issues. Another misleading idea about language is the belief that words are harmless. People say that very casually and carelessly, that words are harmless, but words are not harmless. The use of words can be destructive and it can be constructive. Sometimes when you affirm people or you affirm even children, you find that they are happy, you build their self-esteem, you encourage them, and you can use a single word to bring somebody down to make either a child or an adult totally lose self-esteem just by the words that we speak. So while the words themselves may seem useless, they can bring about reactions, you know. Therefore, they need to be used. Them words need to be used with care because words can hurt people, either young or old. Merely saying you look pretty to someone may just change, you know, change the mood, change the way that person feels. But you look at someone and you say, ah, your shoes would have been better if you did it like this. And such a person may just take offense. 
So when we realized that he was actually not harmless, we know how to make use of words appropriately. Because some people, a lot of people throw out words, you know, they say words are like eggs. Once it drops on the floor, you can't pack it again. But when people are angry, there are a lot of people who just say things that, you know, they will regret later that they made use of such words. Because ordinarily they'll say, it's not me. I would not have said such a thing. So as conflict managers, our understanding of this will help us to guide even the disputing parties, you know, to know what they ought to do. Okay, a biting criticism or personal attack can stay vivid in one's memory for years, like I just mentioned. Some words can provoke a physical response, a punch in the, a punch in the face, perhaps. You know, this is very common among maybe couples. They will always say that men don't talk. They don't know how to talk, but women have razor mouth. So sometimes you hear of a man slapping his wife. I'm like, I, I wouldn't have slapped her, but she provoked me. That means she provoked him with her words. You know, it can be vice versa. For some men to, you know, use it. So we must, you know, be careful with the words we use so that it's easy for us as conflict managers to guide conflicting parties that the words they use through communication can either, you know, make or mar the, the relationship between them and whoever they have conflicts with. So the section three of this is effective communication skills in conflict. Effective communication skills in conflict. Now we have talked about, you know, how communication um, can either mark, can be dysfunctional or can be functional. We have also talked about some misconceptions about metaphor, you know, guiding, disputing people, disputing parties appropriately to make the best use of communication. So as a conflict manager, it is important that we develop skills that will help us to manage conflict very well. So techniques by which a party can both convey their interests and needs and comprehend other parties' interests and needs effectively and productively, that is what effective communication skill is about. Techniques by which a party can both convey their interests and needs and comprehend other parties' interests and needs effectively and productively is what we mean by effective communication skills. That is, you're not just, the parties are not just thinking about themselves, but they can, you know, they have the skills to be able to communicate appropriately to take care of their own needs and interests, as well as give consideration to the interests and needs of the other party. It's when one gets to this point that you can say, yes, I'm a good communicator, or I can communicate appropriately. So conflict parties get sucked in by the desire to win, making it hard to listen to and empathize with the other side. Most of the time, nerves are raised when people are, you know, having a quarrel or having a dispute. The parties get sucked in by desire to win. They want to, you know, pass their message on. They want to have their way without necessarily considering what the other person is saying. So at such point, it's hard for them to listen to and empathize with the other side. So in conflict... Communication is no longer about sharing productive ideas and viewpoints. It is part of the strategic weapon. In conflict, communication is no longer about sharing productive ideas. We're still talking about what I said earlier, that some people, you know, in conflict, it's no longer about what they actually need to pass across, but they now make use of language in maybe derogative ways or non-constructive ways. So learning effective conflict communication skills is becoming increasingly important for our personal lives and for the lives of our communities, societies, and cultures. I'm sure everybody will agree with the little we have explained and from what we also know from our worldview, from our environment, our day-to-day -day, you know, living, that it is very important to have effective communicated, to acquire effective conflict communication skills. Because without it, a lot, you know, will not be repaired amongst even our siblings, our families, the society organizations. We find that when communication is done appropriately, 75% of the problems of the conflicts we find in our society, in our lives, would, you know, will have reduced to the barest minimum, will have been taken care of. When you know the right words to say, the Bible says, your words should be seasoned with salt. That's what we're talking about. Some people open their mouths and when they communicate, all they do is you know, when people hear them, they, they just, 
they, they don't build. They don't build. All they say is either to bring people down or they're just saying things that, you know, will escalate such conflict that already exists. So without conflict, communication is often subtle and complicated enough that it can become ineffective. Communication can become ineffective due to one, poor speaking skills, lying as a tactical move in conflict, poor listening skills, relying on assumptions, prior knowledge of beliefs, and stereotypes to form their opinions about other people or groups. We all understand what poor speaking skills are. We have been talking about it. You don't know the right words to speak at the right time. You know, you see somebody that is grieving and you don't know the words to say at such a time. Those are poor speaking skills. Or people are having disputes and all they want to do is talk about their own interests, not considering the other party. Those are poor speaking skills. Using the wrong words, poor speaking skills. They lie as a tactical move. You know, when you're lying, in, maybe in, in a conflict, one party is lying, you know, done something to his or, her, or herself, and it's obvious that such a person is lying, then that communication already is flawed. Then when you don't listen, when they don't listen properly to the other party, that is a result of poor listening skills. You are talking, the other person is talking. So how do you really get to know his or her point? So these are things we have to know as conflict managers. And then when people rely on assumptions, you just assume, you know, somebody is talking at you, you know, uh, there left a lot of us assumptions that human beings do actually. This thing is not right. It's just an assumption. You assume that, that the other party is trying to put you down. You assume that the other party is trying to do one thing or the other. So relying on assumptions is one of those you know, ways that you know that communication is not effective. Then prior knowledge of beliefs and stereotypes. There are a lot of times that we just, you know, we have a knowledge about maybe you had an experience somewhere and you just bring it into a particular situation and then the communication breaks down because you believe that, okay, maybe your vast are this or houses are that or Igbos are this and then you bring that into, a, you know, into relationship. So at the end of the day, Whatever you are communicating is tainted by that by that prior knowledge that you have of maybe one person. Maybe a Yoruba man has done something bad to you in the past and you just conclude that every Yoruba man or woman is like this. And then you put that into your, you know, your communication in conflict. These are the kind of things that can make communication break down. The stereotype is still part of what I'm talking about. You already have an idea that this is something. You know, you have this wide idea about which may not even have any basis at all. So when you have such about other people, there's every possibility that your relationship with such people or people who fall into that category would, you know, be tainted with that stereotype that you have, which at the end of the day will lead to conflict. So we need to know some of these things as conflict managers so that when we are settling or we're managing a conflict, we'll be able to identify precisely where the problem is from when it comes to communication. Sometimes people pretend to listen, whereas they are focusing on what they are going to say next to get back or win the argument. In conflict situation, you know, you find out people, because they are talking, they are, they are eager to say they are going to, you know, bring out what is what they are angry about. Sometimes they don't even listen to the other person. Perhaps if people will just pause a little, conflicting parties will pause a little and listen to the other party, they will see that they are probably even talking about the same thing, or they are, you know, they can actually come to a convergence and so it is put to be settled. So no matter how you look at it, communication, whether good, whether used functionally or dysfunctionally, is a key part of all conflict. It could be the lack of it, it could be the you know bad use of it, it could be anything and at any stage of conflict. It is therefore critical that conflict managers and conflict parties learn and exercise good communication skills in order to be able to, you know, limit um, conflicts.
So the skills that we need to acquire as conflict managers, that we need to try to pass across to conflicting parties include, they have been broken down into five main areas. You have the speaker, the writer, you have the receiver. That's, this is the process of communication, okay? So we need to know what each of those processes entail for us to know where the problems, we have to identify at what point did this conflict begin? At what point? Is it while the speaker was trying to encode the message? Was it during the period it was passing through the channel or the medium? Or was it even after it got to the decoder of that message or the receiver? At what point? When you know, or is it the environment? You know, So we need to know these five um, skills to be able to you know, settle or manage a conflict appropriately. Now, the speaker or the writer can also be called the encoder. That is the person that has the urge to pass a message across. The person initiating the communication is responsible for making themselves clear and avoiding hostile, misleading, or ambiguous content. So what we're saying here is that if you are the one communicating, you're the one initiating the communication, you're the one that has the urge to pass a message across to a receiver, then you have to ensure that you make your message clear, you avoid hostile hostility, you avoid misleading words or ambiguous content so that the receiver is able to decode the message you have sent, if not 100% to it. So he beholds on the speaker, the writer, to ensure that he does that. Then this assumes that person actually wants to give them, make use of the right words, make, you know, send unambiguous content, and that means you want the, uh, the receiver to actually understand the message the way you have coded it. However, deception is sometimes chosen as a means to mislead and manipulate others. This doesn't help conflict management, okay? Um, when you deliberately, you know, deceive with the message you are sending, then you have the receiver. A communicator's best efforts are foiled when those on the receiving end don't listen or read well. Okay, now these are the responsibilities of the, we just talked about the responsibilities of the encoder, that is the person that is sending a message. Now, the receiver also has a responsibility, you know, I would say he has to make best efforts, you know, to ensure that he listens well or reads the messages well or interprets it appropriately. Said is very mentioned earlier that people do have stereotypes, they have their beliefs, you know, and because of that, they already, you know, they have this competitive nature of not even listening to what is coming. So when you have that mindset already, there's bound to be communication breakdown, preconceptions or biases, or simply by doing selective hearing. Selective hearing is like you want to hear what you want to hear. What you don't want to hear, you don't want to hear. And when that happens, you end up losing grip of you know the message that's actually being passed across. We should not. We should. People should avoid pre, pre, you know, preconceptions or biases. It should be limited to the barest minimum. So, as a conflict manager that has all this information, that has all these skills and knowledge, you'll be able to guide disputing, you know, parties appropriately. You'll be able to bring out. What Tune out others from time to time. We need to work on being better. People don't listen when they're in conflict. They don't listen. They hear, you know, they just situations would arise or be escalated. It is therefore necessary that active listening should be employed or empathetic listening. That's what, you know, disputing factors and parties need and the habit of listening actively. Then the third one, that the third stage in the process, 
is the message. Draw it. It will be like encoder, sender. Then you have the message that has been encoded. Then it passes through a medium or a channel. It can be email, it can be letter, it can be telephone call. And then you have the receiver. That is the normal process. So talking about the message now, the content of the message can tell and how accurately it might be received. We talk is interpreted at least as much as possible. So the content you know, is important. Then great care must be taken when the content is technically complex. When it's technically complex, it means it can be it can be interpreted in various ways. So the encoder for how such a message is passed across. There must be we must take great care also when an idea that is being introduced, an idea that is being introduced for the first charge implications. Like to, um, during the COVID, during the NSAS protest and such other situations, you know, slide because I lost I got through out of something. Please can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. you are audible. Yes, please we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Please did you stop hearing me from this message? From this slide. I'm not sure this is going to work. Okay, so I was saying that um, great care must be taken. Now talking about the message that's been passed across. Great care must be taken when the content is technically complex, when an, idea, when an idea is being introduced for the first time, or when it has controversial or emotionally charged implications. I said, for instance, when NLC or any group of people want to go on strike, the spokesman for government cannot just come out and say anything and anyhow that they don't care. People can go on strike, this will happen. And so in such situations, the message must be very you know, sensitively considered before sending it because it can lead to you know emotionally charged you know responses or feedback from you know the conflicting parties. Change was balanced to everything. And here can inappropriately because of language barrier or because of interpretation maybe a message is sent in Hausa language and somebody there are different languages so there are barriers already one must be careful how such messages are coded or passed across. Now, the fourth one in the process, the means of communication, that is the medium. Another name for it is channel. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, you are audible, we can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Doc. Yes, we can hear you, please. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. The fourth point I'll be looking at is the means of communication. Now, the sender has sent a message. What's that? With? You can't hear me. We can. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. So the fourth one is the means of communication. That is the medium of communication. 
either you call it medium or channel. And this is very, very important than we sometimes know. For example, messages can be sent through email, can be sent through text messages, you know. But when some of these messages are sent, you know, we have verbal and nonverbal communication. Sometimes nonverbal communication even speaks louder than verbal communication. So because of this kind of situation, we have to understand that there could be some um, there could be some fillers that will be missing in the in the communication that we are passing across. When sometimes the entire message itself doesn't come through, and sometimes uh, when you're trying to resolve conflict, there may be a high risk of misunderstanding for whatever reasons, anything in that medium of communication. So we must be sensitive to it as well. We should not just think about the message alone, but how was that message communicated to the other party? It may be the medium of communication that caused the problem. Maybe the medium of communication. Perhaps um, somebody in our society, for instance, will respect elders a lot. Maybe you want to pass a message to an elderly person that ordinarily you are expected to go there to deliver such a message perhaps even with a bottle of wine, and then you just pick the phone and call such a person. There could be communication breakdown because the channel you have used to pass that message is not appropriate as far as the receiver is concerned. It's like, you know, you are being rude. Why can't you come? Why do you have to call him on the phone? We still have some things in our society. So our cultural biases, biases so, you know, influence how communication is received. That is, what role? Is the medium, the channel by which such a communication was passed? Is it the appropriate medium? So as a communication expert, as a manager, you must how did you tell him? Okay, he told me that my, my house rent was due and then, you know, Got why rent is due. You know, it's not as if you are not going to pay, but you are offended by the fact a young person to come and remind you that you know your due or the money you are owing. Hello, Dr. Jepe. Sorry about that. Yes, Paul. Okay, okay. We lost you. I, I can hear you. Can you yeah. hear me? No, we lost you at a point. When you say yeah, the okay. money you are going. So, um, okay. Okay, okay. So, I was just trying to illustrate that sometimes the medium, the means, the channel of communication may be the real problem. So, as a communication expert and as a conflict manager, it is important for you to interrogate every stage of the communication process. We want to know whether the sender constructed a message, encoded a message that is not ambiguous, that is very clear. We want to be sure that what that he has, he or she has observed due diligence at that point. We want to find out about the message, whether it represented exactly what the sender had in mind. You know, was it well coded? Then you want to know, you know, this the means now is where I am. How was the message passed across? Sometimes you hear people say, it's not as if I will not pay his money, but the way he's asking me about it, that is why I'm not paying. Or maybe each time he comes to my house in front of my wife, that's when he asks me for the money I'm owing him. That's why I don't want to pay him. So we're still talking about medium, you know, in a certain way. So I'm saying here that as a, as a um, conflict manager, you have to interrogate every point of the process through these skills that you know already. Maybe like, okay, how come it's not pain? How come this conflict, you know, has arisen? What really happened? And then they begin to tell you that he said this, he said that. So you want to now find out, okay, at what point did this problem really start? Is it at the sender level? Is it at the message? Is it the message itself that was sent? Or was it the means by which it was passed across? That is, those are the due diligences that must happen at this point. Now, Face-to-face -face communication isn't always practical, and sometimes it might not even be desirable. If you find out that the level of conflict 
is at an escalated level, then points is at an escalated point, then going to the person, you know, to explain something may not be ideal. Sometimes you, sometimes you offend someone and you feel like, okay, let me just send a WhatsApp message so that at his own or at her own convenience, he or she can read it, assimilate before it gets back to me. Because if you go to such a person while he's still boiling, you may aggravate even whatever you are trying to communicate. So sometimes letters may seem a bit formal, but they also might take the sting out of an otherwise infl inflammable. Let me reduce this. Yeah. Um, inflammatory communicate. That is sometimes writing, you know, the time it takes for the letter to get to the person, the time it takes for he or she to read it, digest it, pick it again and read, may actually, you know, reduce or take away completely whatever was the cause of the conflict. So when any means is used, however, the limitations must be taken into account, especially in conflict to look at the pros and cons of every method or means that's being used or you plan to use to settle such a conflict. Prof, please move my slide, I can't move it. Okay, now the fifth area, the fifth thing to consider in the process as well is the communicating environment. I've alluded to that somewhere as I was talking. The environment is taken for granted in a calm and rational exchange. You know, when people are rational, there's no, there's no um, high tempers, there's no um, anger. Sometimes we take the environment in which, you know, we communicate for granted. And I explain part of it even at the stage four, which is the medium. I talked about the place, you know. Sometimes when the mood is heated, where hostilities and mistrust are apparent, environment take their tone on communication. Is a typical example is what I said then. You want to collect your money from someone that is owing, and then the person goes and meets him at the beer parlor and reminds him that his rent is due. That environment is totally wrong because that's probably he's even with his girlfriend or whoever, his mate that he's trying to, you know, pose for, and then you go there, that communication will definitely break down right there and then. And he'll tell you, I'm not paying, go to hell, you know. So the environment in which communication takes place is very important. Those are the points that you as a, you know, a conflict manager will try to find out. Okay, you went to ask for your money. Where? How? Where did it take place? And he'll tell you it was in his family house. And why can you do that? Why did you just call him out to tell him something? So these are literally two points that we as communication experts, as conflict managers, must take into consideration. We must interrogate so that we can get to the root of the kind of conflict that we're trying to sort out, we're trying to settle. Sometimes it might be better to wait until the mood changes, especially when offering controversial or complex ideas. It's still part of what I said earlier, that we have to know the environment that communication takes place for it to for us to have successful communication. The next slide, please. Uh, you can now move your slides. Okay, thank you. So to conclude this aspect, good communication skills we can see cannot be overemphasized. They are important in all aspects of life, but they are especially important when one is involved in a conflict. Conflicts can be made much worse by careless communication, where inflammatory statements are made accidentally, stereotypes replace parts, and good listening is stifled. This is just a summary of everything we have been talking about, that good communication cannot be overemphasized at every stage of conflict, before, during, or after. So we must ac acquire the necessary skills as conflict managers. Uh, we must pay attention to the five areas of concern that we just discussed. Uh, conflict managers need to hone their communication skills in order to provide useful services to their clients and also help them develop the requisite communication skills.
Now, we go to the next session, which is empathic listening. Empathic listening is still one of the skills for effective communication. Empathic listening. So, in conflict, in reducing the intensity of the conflict, even if the conflict cannot be that easily resolved. Okay, one of the most common techniques that are effectively is active or empathic listening. Of course, other communication techniques conflict is narrative communication and so on and so forth. But here we want to look at empathic listening. So empathic listening focuses on trying to communicate without placing blame and really trying to hear and understand what the other person is saying. Until recently, um, people did not really take cognizance of the fact that how you listen can actually affect you know, how you reason. It can affect how you perceive, how you interpret messages, how you receive communication. We so focused on speaking, people learn speaking skills all over the place, but nobody was talking for a very long time about listening that how you listen also affects communication. How you listen also affects how, whether there'll be conflict in communication or not. So empathic listening has been identified as a key skill to know so that as a conflict manager, for instance, you can also guide your, you have to learn how to listen empathically and then guide your, you know, disputants, people that are in conflict that you're trying to help. You have to guide them to know that how they listen also matters. When people are angry, they listen, they, they don't listen, they hear words and they just speak it like that. When, when you listen actively or empathically, you're able to decode, you're able, you're able to see through, you're able to weigh whatever you are hearing, whatever is being said from different perspectives. You're able to make a good and reasonable conclusion or interpretation of the communication that is coming to you. So even when the conflict is not resolved in an intervention, the listening process can have a profound impact on the parties. You know, it doesn't mean that you're able to resolve the, resolve the, in, the issue or the dispute right there and there. But because they have been taught or you, have, you as a manager has guided them into listening empathically, sometimes, most of the time, they're able to now see new points from the perspective of the other person. Okay? And then it reduces the tension that is in the conflict. And then gradually, please, can you hear me? Wow. Hello? Yes, Margaret, can, I hear you. We can okay. hear you. Okay. okay, thank you. We can hear you. Okay. Let me go back. Okay. So the ability and willingness to listen with empathy is useful for everyone involved in a, in a conflict. It sets the conflict manager apart from others involved in the conflict. What that means is that even you as a conflict manager must learn to listen well, learn to know when to speak, when to interrupt, and when not to interrupt. You know, when you have good listening ears, you know, sometimes we say someone has excellent or good listening ears, that is, the person knows when to say, mm. the person knows when to say, sorry. You know, like that, you must put yourself in the position of the person you are listening to or whoever is, you know, communicating with you. So you as a conflict manager, first of all, you must learn to listen. Listening means you cannot just be interrupting and asking questions when the person is speaking. We often say that as a counselor, you find out that a lot of people who have problems just want to be listened to, even including children including our children, we just, they just want to be listened to. Please, are we still together? Yes. Okay, sorry, okay. it keeps going back and forth. Okay. Uh, so, um, I was saying that it is important as conflict managers to learn how to listen empathically. 
And then I said, even when there are no conflicts, when you're a good listener, you solve a lot of problems for people. All some people need is for you to just listen, just hear them out. And that's why we tell parents that don't shut your children up when they have things to say. You know, sometimes even among couples, you find out that they are not listening to each other. The husband is trying to talk or the wife is trying to, you know, bring out her soul to share with him. And he's everywhere, you know, dropping criticisms up and down. You don't find him in that mood, you know, maybe that you can actually talk to him or she doesn't find her in that mood. So empathic listening is a skill that if you have, then you're good. If you don't have, desire to acquire it. Then as a conflict manager, you need it. And then when you have it, it helps you to now guide disputing parties how on how to listen empathically. Because once they can do that, then they reason from the other person's perspective. Empathic listening, also called reflective listening, is a way of listening and responding to another person that improves mutual understanding and trust. You know, you try to listen objectively now. You're not thinking about yourself alone at that point. You're not looking at it from your own perspective alone. So it is an essential skill for third parties and disputants alike as it enables the listener to receive and accurately interpret the speaker's message and then provide an appropriate response. Provide an appropriate response. Okay. Sorry, because I'm trying to get my slide out of here. So um, these are some of the benefits of empathic listening. So the response is an integral part of the listening process and can be critical to the success of conflict management. Now, empathic benefits of empathic listening continues. It builds trust and respect. It builds trust and respect. It enables the disputants to release their emotions it reduces tensions, it encourages the surfacing of information and creates a safe environment that is conducive to collaborative problem solving. So these are some of the benefits of empathic listening. It's a win-win situation when disputants can listen well. Sometimes it is one party that is listening and the other is not. But as a conflict manager, you will have realized that and you know exactly what to say, you know, to ensure that the other person calms down to also begin to listen. So um, it is a skill that we all need. How to listen with empathy? How to listen with empathy? Empathy is the ability to project oneself into the personality of another person in order to better understand that person's emotions or feelings. Please, are we together? Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. we can do. So, all right, thank you. So, like I said, empathy is the ability to project oneself into the personality of another person in order to better understand that person's emotions or feelings. I think this is clear because that's all I've been talking about. Then through empathic listening, the listener lets the speaker know, I understand your problem and how you feel about it. I'm interested in what you are saying and I'm not judging. Those are the things, even without saying it, without saying these words I just said, when you listen empathically, the person that is talking to you, that is communicating with you, will know that this is what you're saying. There's a way you listen with attention, wrapped attention. There's a way you nod your head. There's a way you, you know, empathize that the person will feel good to say more. You know, sometimes you see people, there are some individuals, I have come across a few of them, that know how to listen. You will have emptied your entire being because... You can see them, their eyes are speaking. Their faces are talking to you that, my dear, I understand you. I feel what you are feeling. Even if at the end of the day, they, you know, advise you maybe against those things you're talking about. But the first thing they need is for someone to really, you know, be in that position to say, I understand how you're feeling. For an average human being, when you say, I understand how you're feeling, I can feel you, you know, it brings down whatever anger, tension, or problem that they have. So empathic listening, you know, is very, very desirable for us as conflict managers. 
and it is good with help to inculcate or to guide our disputants into, you know, having or creating that um, skill for themselves as well. In that, when you, when you listen emphatically, you are telling the speaker that, I'm not going to judge you. Just tell me what the problem is. We are going to jointly walk this through. I'm going to, I'm going to assist. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to be there for you to solve this problem. You know, so if you have that skill, it's excellent. And we must also guide our disputants that we are trying to settle matters with or for to understand that they need to listen well. There are a lot of people when the other person is talking, they are interrupting. They cannot listen empathically like that. So those are the things you as a conflict manager must ensure that you control in a very subtle, gentle, you know, way that um, the parties will also not see you as judging them <laughs> because that's very important too. So the listener unmistakably conveys this message through words and non-verbal behaviors, including body language. All right, that is the listener conveys, these messages I just said, I understand your problem. I know how you feel about it. I'm interested in what you are saying. I'm not judging you. You don't have to say it with your mouth. But your non-verbal behavior, your body language, your posture, your gesture, all would show the person that is listening that indeed you are together and you're empathizing. So how to listen with empathy? In so doing, the listener encourages the speaker to fully express herself or himself, free of interruption, criticism, or being told what to do. I think I said it earlier. When you listen and Particularly, the speaker is encouraged to say it is because he can see your body language that yes, this person feels for me. Then the even where such a person sometimes you plan a leave, for instance, but at the end of the day, you just find that you are saying more than you but sometimes it's good body bring to address you know so it's, it's usually sufficient to let the speaker know and understand you know that is when you are talking one on one and when you have two people you can also do that you know you can if you're as a good conflict listens more than the other. You must know, because you have these skills, you must know how to calm that person that's listening properly and then listen properly. When he has maybe shouted and done everything, calm him or her down and say, okay, now, can you listen to this other person? Can we hear what she has to say? So you have to, you know, subtly know how and when, you know, to actually ensure that ensured or is assured. Empathic listening is a core skill, therefore, of individuals in many aspects of their professional and personal lives. So we're saying here that even apart from being a conflict manager, when you know how to listen, when you develop the skill of listening empathically, that is, you don't interrupt. You're not fast to, somebody is trying to tell you his problem. You're not quick to judge. You don't even judge. You know, there's a way people open up completely, like I said earlier. So if you have such a skill, it will help you in your own job, in your professional, in your profession, in your personal life, in your marriages, in your you know relationships. And then without a conflict manager, parties can increase their negotiating effectiveness through the use of empathy. That is, you know, when there are conflicting parties, even when you as a conflict manager is not there, but you know you have been able to encourage them to know how to listen empathically, then you find out that the escalated tension is likely to gradually diminish because now they have put themselves in the position of the other party. Now, the power of empathic listening in conflict settings. According to Medlin Bolin Allen, through empathic listening, the listener does the following things. One, acknowledge the speaker. He increase the speaker's self-esteem and confidence. Tells the speaker you are important and I'm not judging you. Gains the speaker's cooperation. Reduces stress and tension. 
build teamwork, that is, we're doing this together, gain trust, elicit openness, gain a sharing of ideas and thoughts, and obtain more valid information about the speakers and the subject. I'm sure you can see that this summarizes everything we've been talking about as far as empathic listening is concerned. These are the various benefits that can actually, you know, and when, you, when all this is out, I can assure you that the conflict is getting to the barest minimum gradually, okay? And even when you are canceling, all these things are very, very important. To obtain these results, Pauline Allen says, a skilled listener, one, takes information from others while remaining non-judgmental and empathic. Acknowledges the speaker in a way that invites the communication to continue and provides a limited but encouraging response, carrying the speaker's idea one step forward. So the importance of empathic listening cannot be overemphasized. It is very, very key. It's as important as knowing how to speak well. It's as important as you know, knowing how to speak well. So we have some guidelines for empathic listening. Madeline Bolin Allen offers these guidelines one, you need to be attentive, that is be interested, be alert and not distracted. It can be very painful when somebody is trying to confide in you or is trying to communicate with you and he sees that your mind is far away, you're just staring into her face or his face, you're just staring into space space, without really being there. It's like throwing, you know, it's like a waste of time. For somebody that's very emotional, they can even end the talk at that point in time. So you need to be alert and not dis be distracted. You have to create a positive atmosphere through non-verbal behavior. You see, this keeps coming up. In communication, even though we're not dwelling into that so much here, non-verbal communication is very important. The way your eyes look, the way you hold your hand, the way you nod your head, all communicate to the party or the parties. So it is important as a manager of um, disputes to know the right way. Second one is be a sounding board. Allow the speaker to bounce ideas and feelings off you while assuming a non-judgmental and non-critical manner. Let them be free. Let, let the disputing parties or the party that you're you know, with, talking with, allow them to bounce ideas. Let them say it, whether it makes sense or not. Let them just say it. Just be there to listen. When they have landed and you have really heard everything, they can then analyze with, you know, with um, empathy. They can then analyze with empathy and let them see their weak points, let them see, you know, where they have gone wrong. And they will take it because while they were speaking, you know, you were listening empathically. So they think you agree with them. You give that impression that you are agreeing with them. That's because you want them to empty their barrels. You want them to empty everything so that you can then, Use your skills as a conflict manager to guide them aright and to settle or manage such conflicts. Please, are we still together? Yes, yeah, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes, we Number are. three, thank you. Number three, according to Madeline Bolin Allen, you don't ask a lot of questions. They can give the impression you are grilling the speaker. I'm sure this is clear. You don't ask, you don't interrupt with so many questions. Sometimes it's difficult for a lot of people to actually confide in someone. It's difficult for them to, you know, say it as it is, whether it's in dispute or in counseling form or whatever situation you find yourself as a conflict manager. Because, you know, sometimes conflicts, most of the time, conflicts are between two people, you know, or more. But in some other situations, somebody might actually conflict with himself because he's confused. And you just need somebody to speak to. When you find yourself in such a situation, you must adopt empathic listening. Don't ask a lot of questions. Allow the person to say as much as they can. You can note things. You can jot some things down. Because sometimes they keep asking questions as someone is talking or relaying or telling you what happened or what this person did. You may just break the flow of communication. you know, And then the person loses the grip. Okay. Maybe it was giving you a narrative that is going, you know, sequentially. And then suddenly you ask a question and you lose this track, as, you know, and then even you will not have the kind of facts 
that you plan to have. It will look as if you are grilling the person. And probably at that point in time, that's the last thing such a person needs to be grilled, to be, you know, either in counseling or in dispute managing. So we must be conscious of that. Uh, four, act like a mirror. Act like a mirror. That it reflect back what you think the speaker is saying and feeling. Try to do a recap in your mind. Okay. Number five, don't discount the speaker's feelings by using stock phrases like, it's not that bad, or you'll feel better tomorrow. That is, this person is trying to bring out some I'm not happy things, and you're making it look like it's not that important. You should not do that as a conflict manager. You should not do that because it makes them feel like maybe you're already judging. You're already telling them it's not that bad. It's not that serious. You may think you're trying to calm them down, but that's not the feeling you are passing across. Just allow them, either in a dispute situation or you're just talking to one person, allow them to say everything before you begin to now use their points either to advise or to cancel or to resolve issues. You know, it's not that bad. He knows it's that bad. That's why he's talking to you or she's talking to you. So don't pass such. That's what um, the scholar is talking about. Six, don't let the speaker hook you. This can happen if you get angry or upset. Allow yourself to get involved in an argument or pass judgment on the other person. As a conflict manager, listen emphatically and objectively. That is, don't get carried away by what one particular person is saying to the point that you begin to pass judgment already on the other person. You have to listen with objectivity. While you're empathizing with him, that person should know that you will still empathize with the other person that is speaking before you guide them into, you know, resolving whatever issues that is before you. Number seven, indicate you are listening by providing brief non committal acknowledging responses, e.g., mm, I see, really, you know, just so you're understanding what they're saying. Giving non verbal acknowledgments, e.g., head nodding, facial expressions matching the speaker, open and relaxed body expression, eye contact, invitations to say more, e.g., tell me about it. I would like to hear about that. Feel free to tell me. Those are the kind of words that should come out, you know, for you to get all the facts that you need to, as a conflict manager. Now, guidelines for empathic listening. Follow good listening ground rules. Some of these things are what we have said before or in a summary form. Don't interrupt. Don't change the subject or move in a new direction. It is not your matter. You are just there as a conflict manager. Don't rehearse in your own head. Don't interrogate. Don't teach. Don't give advice. Do to the speaker what you understand and how you think the speaker feels. Okay? Some of these may look, one or two may look contradictory, but the essence of this entire thing is that you want them to feel free to talk. Want them to feel free to empty their minds without you already, you know, giving your opinion and so on and so forth. Conclusion: the ability to listen with empathy may be the most important attribute of interveners who succeed in gaining the trust and cooperation of parties to intractable conflicts and other disputes with high emotional content. I'm sure if you reflect as an individual you will see that there are some kind of people in your life that you can actually speak to freely. Why? They're empathic listeners. They know how to listen. They know, there's a way they make you feel when you talk to them. If you don't have it as a natural person, then you acquire the skills. Among its other advantages, as Bolinalian points out, empathic listening has empowering qualities. It has empowering qualities. It empowers you to have information that ordinarily you may not, you know, have had. There's some things people will not ordinarily tell you, whether in a dispute situation or a normal, maybe, counseling situation. But when you listen empathically, you become a custodian of a lot of people's secrets. In our daily life, it happens, you know. There's just that person or those persons that, they just know how to get it out of you. They know how to make you unburden yourself, you know. So providing an opportunity for people to talk through their problem 
may clarify their thinking as well as provide the necessary emotional release. By the time people or disputants are able to bring out everything, you know, because you as a conflict manager, you're able to listen empathically. By the time they bring, sometimes, they will even tell you they are no longer angry. They will tell you, actually, and it's not that, okay, I forgive him or I forgive her. That's because somebody has listened empathically to them. That's because they've been able to embody everything and then they can see clearly to that. It's not that serious. Let me just forget about it. Don't worry, and so on and so forth. So when people speak like that, you don't even have to say much as a conflict manager because the matter is resolved. By the time this person empties his, his mind, the other person empties her mind, and you have listened like, you know, giving them all the attention, they realize that the conflict at the end of the day is no conflict. They can actually, you know, get past it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very Prof. much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ifia Jeffe, for that wonderful session. Yes. Um, he's only an expert on communication that can have delivered it the way you did. So um, this is the last model for today. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions and answer about this module about previous model and uh, about the whole uh, exercise. If we have any remarks, please, this is the time. Yeah, thank you, Madam Nora. We are thanking Dr. Ajekpe. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Dr. Delo Ogun is also saying thank you for that thank wonderful you. lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so welcome remarks now, questions and answers. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you for that wonderful lecture. Thank you. I, yes, because of that lecture, I was just wondering uh, where the place of body language is in communication. Sometimes we don't have to verbalize our feelings or emotions before uh, we pass on information to our listeners or students or whoever. Is there a place in communication, especially for conflict managers? Is there a place of body language? Or we just have to say it, verbalize everything, as the case may be. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. I actually alluded to that a great deal. I talked about nonverbal communication. Okay. I talked about body language. I talked about, you know, your your posture, your gesture. I mentioned all of that. They matter okay. a great deal, yes, in communication. I said, even when you are doing empathic listening, the way you nod your head mm. may go a long way to, you know, show the person, the party, that you are with them, you are listening, you're empathizing with them. So body language is absolutely very important you know in you know some of these things the look i said it i said the look on your you know on your eyes the way you tilt your head even the way you hold your yeah. chin mm. you know will speak a lot so yeah either the disputing parties or somebody that you're trying to cancel to calm down so it's yeah. very very key it's not every time you say everything the okay. look in your eyes is enough to, you know, yes to thank pass you. across the message thank you very much thank you you're welcome ma'am Okay, any other person? Clarifications? Yeah. Yes, you are correct, mm -hmm. Madam Nora. Communication is imperative. Communication is imperative. And so we as conflict managers, just a quick recap on what Dr. Jepe said. We need to become a communication expert ourselves for us to be able to influence or improve the communication skills of the parties. And that um, when we are managing a conflict, we want to look at the role communication has played in that conflict. Is it at the messenger, I mean, the, the sender's level, where did the message go wrong? Is it the content and so on and so forth? And also in addition to that, while handling the conflict, we want to ensure that parties communicate effectively. 
we need to let them know that communication in conflicts should be handled with care. If a party is given to using careless words and feel, I mean, she is just words. I'm just, am I hitting him? Am I, I'm just saying it the way I feel it. If we want to let the parties, let that party know that those words are not harmless. And those words may not mean exactly what you intend to the other party. Maybe because of differences of culture. I've been in a situation where, where, <laughs> where people, uh, where somebody has done something or said something that I was very angry. Okay, this wasn't even a, a verbal thing, you know. In Yoruba land, when somebody is lying down, maybe whatever, lying down on the mat, on the floor, whatever, and you kick him, no matter how gentle the kick is, from my upbringing, when you wake somebody up with a slight kick or a good kick, it's like a slave. It has wrong, very wrong connotations. But this person did it, and I was like, maybe I just kicked you just to let you know that you should stand up. Ah, I was very, I was very angry. In fact, I jumped up out of the sleep. <laughs> and but to to the person, she, it was just do something harmless. The kick wasn't a big deal, but just tapping with the foot was for me. No, 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 no. Because of the negative association I had with that kind of art from my culture. The when we're talking about types of info, uh, types of conflict, we talked about information conflict. Sometimes people are in conflict because of the use of information, because of communication. Either the speaker, the sender, the content, the environment, and so on. And also the environment of the conflict management. Now, when we want to manage conflict, we may want to be conscious of sitting arrangement of the way the environment looks. There are environments that are not suitable for managing conflicts. So once again, I want to say a very big thanks to Dr. Ajepe for delivering that session to us. And I want to thank you, our participants, for having exercised the patience to go through this very intensive uh, workshop. You know, this is a very intensive one. We spent minus break. We'll have spent like uh, close to, is it six or seven hours? Nine to 12. Then uh, we have one hour break, or one hour 13 minute break then. And we are wrapping up by five. It's like nine to five minus two. One and a half hours. That's a lot. That's a lot. So I want to thank you. It's part of the effort. It's part of the sacrifices we almost make to become conflict managers. So I wish us uh, all well. And uh, I want to encourage those of us who have not engaged our assignments and our activities to please do so. Please do so. Uh, those of us who have not gone to our groups, please let us identify our groups and participate. Our interaction in the groups on these assignments are part of learning. They're part of the process of learning. So, having said that, and in absence of no other questions, remarks, or comments, we want to say thank you, God bless you, and uh, we meet tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Very good Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Ma? I said tomorrow for our pounded yam. Yes, that is <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, madam. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. <laughs> okay.